Only a few phrases in English literature have left the printed page to gain their own immortality. Shakespeare's to be or not to be is one. Charles Dickens, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, is another. None perhaps has captured the world's imagination more completely than elementary, my dear Watson, elementary. Spoken by the most brilliant and popular private detective of all time. The question is still debated to this day. Who was Sherlock Holmes? Positively inhuman about you at times. <laughs> my dear Watson, I never allow my judgment to be biased by personal qualities. While it is common knowledge that Conan Doyle wrote the adventures of Sherlock Holmes, many readers were and still are convinced that this unique detective actually existed. Did he? <laughs> This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. An expert on the Sherlock Holmes period, Peter Lovesey. London of Sherlock Holmes was a sinister place like the vaults of the Western Dock. It was a place of extreme poverty and squalor, where Jack the Ripper roamed the fog-enshrouded streets of the East End, looking for his miserable victims. And the police were quite unable to control the crime. But many people look back on it as a golden age, when Queen Victoria had reigned for as long as anyone could remember, and the upper classes could feel secure safeguarded by the greatest of all detectives, Mr. Sherlock Holmes of Baker Street. The fact of the matter was, in the decade prior to Holmes' appearance in print, the London police had failed to combat the growing crime rate. Even corruption in the force flourished. There were dynamitings involving the Irish problem, ruthlessly suppressed meetings of the unemployed, and most of all, the notorious Jack the Ripper murders, never solved. Not all police were inefficient or corrupt, of course, but leadership was clearly lacking. The public was not being served. The birth of Sherlock Holmes as a public figure is documented in a rare collection owned by Stanley Mackenzie. The big cornerstone of any Sherlock Holmes collection and uh, which is the envy of most collectors, is Beaton's Christmas Annual for 1887. In this, A Study in Scarlet was first published. This was the first appearance of the first Sherlock Holmes story. Conan Doyle was paid 25 pounds for the copyright, and he never received another penny. Sherlock Holmes's reputation was enhanced by a play about him, written by an American actor, William Gillette. This poster shows Gillette himself in the gas chamber scene in the play. Gillette probably played the part of Holmes more times than any other actor. An 1895 recording preserves his performance. How the deuce did you know my wife was away? Marvelous, marvelous. Elementary, my dear fellow, elementary. From theater to motion pictures was also an elementary step for the master sleuth. Fame and fortune would quickly accrue to Doyle as well. We are getting on, Watson. I'm glad to see you in a more cheerful mood. We've done remarkable... By 1933, a third version of A Study in Scarlet had been made, with Reginald Owen playing the detective whose personal and professional style set him apart from all others. A large number represented the page, the second, the small number, the column, and the other figures, the message. 
You'll find it decoded on the table. Every Holmes adventure is different, but in all of them he plays the violin, of which he was a master. A client, Watson. Well, the widow is standing under the street lamp. A widow? Would you like to bet on that? Of course. Well, I'm not going down the street to ask her. Ah. Won't be necessary. She's made up her mind. So you deduce at a distance, eh? Not in this case. I recognized her features. She's a Mrs. Murphy. Her husband was murdered three days ago. You mean the man that was found dead in a train? Exactly. Come in. Uh, Mrs. Murphy to see you, sir. Mr. Holmes, I'm in such a mess. Such a mess. My husband up and died without leaving me as much as I... Holmes would never refuse a woman in distress, whether she be plain or beautiful. And in some cases, he might reluctantly have to turn her over to the authorities. For under his cool exterior burned a passion for justice to be feared by all villains. London's most dangerous crook, the king of blackmailers. A gliding, slidey, venomous snake. Once in his power, he'll squeeze and squeeze until he's drained his victims dry. More than once I've had my net around him, but so far he's managed to wriggle his way out. But the time has come, Watson. No shot broke that window. How did this modern detective come into being? What was Holmes' creator like? Arthur Conan Doyle was born in Edinburgh in 1859. Raised in one of the gracious Georgian homes in the new town, he enrolled at the age of 17 as a student of medicine at the university. Here he learned the methods of diagnosis, which applied to the analysis of crime, became the basis of Holmes' famous methods of detection. No one questions that the inspiration for his quick-witted hero came from Doyle's tutor, Dr. Joseph Bell, here recreated for In Search Of. I've always considered Conan Doyle as uh, one of the best students I ever had. He was exceedingly interested in anything concerned with diagnosis. I never tired of trying to discover those little details that one must look for. I remember he was greatly amused uh, one day. A man came in, sat down. Good morning, Pat. I said, for it was impossible not to see that he was an Irishman. Good morning, Your Honor, replied the patient. Well, and did you like your walk across the links today as you came in from the south side of the town, sir? Yes, replied Pat. Did, did Your Honor see me? Well, even Doyle could not see how I came to know that. Absurdly simple as it was. On a showery day, such as it had been, the reddish clay at the bare part of the links adheres to the boot. Some tiny part of it is bound to remain. There's no such clay anywhere else around the town for miles. Well, that and uh, one or two similar instances excited Doyle's interest and set him uh, discovering for himself uh, in the same direction, which, of course, was exactly what I wanted with him and all my other scholars. Recognition of How much of Bell was in Holmes, how much of Doyle himself, no one can say for sure. As a young doctor with few patients, Doyle found plenty of time to write. Years later, he told why he felt compelled to create Holmes. I had, of course, a scientific training, and uh, I used occasionally to read detective stories. It all annoyed me how in the old-fashioned detective story, the detective always seemed to get at his results, either by some sort of lucky chance or a fluke, or else it was quite unexplained how he got there. He got there, but he never gave an explanation. In a number of films from the 30s, Arthur Wontner is Sherlock Holmes and Ian Fleming is Dr. Watson. Deductive reasoning is on full display. Yes, you move your shaving mirror over to the fireplace. Yes, that's right. My wife has a dressing table where we used to have. How do you know? My right, dear Watson, you're a man of precise habits and considerable regard for your personal appearance. Is I observed that whilst the right hand side of your face is closely shaved, the further we get to the left, the more careless your shaving appears. Till we come to the angle of the jaw where it is positively suddenly. 
see, I now deduce, therefore, that you placed your shaving mirror where the light strikes on the right side of the face. The bed must obviously be across the end of the room, therefore the fireplace is the only place left which could produce that result. Amazing, Holmes. Elementary, my dear Watson. Elementary. Yes, Mr. Henry is the victim. I mean that we should see Mr. Holmes do his stuff. His <laughs> stuff? It's a modern expression, Watson, signifying to display one's talents. That's you know? right. I want Mr. Holmes to tell us what Father's been doing for the last 20 years just by looking at him. <laughs> Holmes is always observant, even of friends. I faith in my abilities, Miss Bantigan, but I'm afraid there's very little data. I merely observed that since we last met, your father has taken to billiards, and that he's recently played a hundred up with Mr. Trevor. That's absolutely correct, Holmes, but how... Oh, my dear fellow, it's simplicity itself. I observe that both you and Mr. Trevor have traces of blue chalk between the forefinger and thumb of your left hand, which was put there, obviously, to steady the cue. There. I hope that satisfies you, Diana. Where were you married, Mrs. Douglas? In New York. Ah. In America? You know nothing of his life. Holmes is not only observant, he is worldly wise. Nothing at all. That mark on his arm, do you know what that is? No. You never asked him. Yes, I did once, but he refused to discuss it. So I never asked again. You have no idea what it is? None whatsoever. Can you suggest anything? Mrs. Douglas, I suggest that you tell me the truth. Mr. Holmes! You know perfectly well what that mark is. You couldn't possibly have lived in America without knowing. All the reckoning with you, Moriarty. In one of the films, our master detective's arch enemy, yeah, Professor Moriarty, uh, is about to push Dr. Watson down an 80-foot abandoned elevator shaft. Very good. I will now remove the panel and wish you a swift journey. Don't move, any of you. Huh? Except you, my dear Watson, who I'm sure will be more comfortable with us. You must excuse me for trespassing on your private property. I've had the lift put in order again. You clever. But no compliments, please. I arrest you, Robert Moriarty. On what charge? Of being concerned in the murder of the table boy, Edward Hunter. Well, it's the most amazing case we've ever solved, Holmes. Elementary, my dear Watson. Elementary. Most criminologists of today will tip their hats in gratitude to the legacy of Holmes and his creator. In fact, a member of the Sherlock Holmes Society is an official of Scotland Yard, Philip Dalton. Mr. Dalton kindly consented to escort us to a very special exclusive place. Behind a pub on an obscure street near Trafalgar Square, the Society has assembled a stirring tribute to the leading detective of all time. Well, here it is, the sitting room at 221B Baker Street. Left exactly as it was on the instructions of Mycroft Holmes, Sherlock's brother. Nothing to be touched. Nothing has been. It's all here. With Persian slipper. With some tobacco still in it. The poker that Sherlock Holmes nearly straightened. The violin that used to play across his knees. There's the gasogene, there's the tantalus. Patriotic VR, picked out in bullet box. And behind me is the bust of Sherlock Holmes that was the target for Colonel Sebastian Moran's air rifle. And you can still see the bullet hole. This room is, of course, a shrine. And it's visited by pilgrims from all over the world. It's especially a shrine for the Sherlock Holmes Society of London. If, in this room, you were to ask me was Sherlock Holmes fact or fiction? I'd like to echo the reply given by our president, Lord Gorbu, who, when asked that question, said, yes. The claim that Sherlock Holmes did exist beyond the imagination of Conan Doyle may seem preposterous to many. But as we shall see, there is evidence to support this belief. The first clues to why Holmes may have been more than simply a fictional character may be found in Doyle's life itself. H.R.F. Keating is one of Doyle's leading biographers. But he did other things in many other fields. 
He was the man who introduced the ski to Switzerland. Before that, it had just been a way of getting about over the snow in Norway. He brought it to Switzerland and started the whole great skiing industry. It was like bringing the pumpkin to America. Uh, then, in the 1914 war, he was the man responsible for the introduction of the modern military steel helmet. He carried out experiments himself with a rifle and proved that protection could be given against the modern bullet. At the same time, he insisted that the troops going over from England to France were equipped with inflatable life jackets and they went to the British Navy as well. As significant as these accomplishments were, however, and knighthood would be his reward, what is little known is that Doyle was involved in many cases himself. In Search Of recreates one of them. Conan Doyle's secretary, Major Wood, was perhaps the prototype for Dr. Watson. One morning in 1906, he opened a letter which he thought would arouse Doyle's interest. It was from George Idalji, an Anglo-Indian lawyer who on weak circumstantial evidence, and possibly because of his ancestry, had been sentenced to seven years in prison, charged with slashing and maiming horses with a razor. After serving three of these seven years, he was inexplicably released, but without a pardon. Now he wrote to Doyle, asking to clear his name. Good morning, Alfred. Now, Arthur, there's a letter here I think you ought to see. It's from a Mr. Idalji, who, it appears, has been the butt of a gross miscarriage of justice. Idalji, Idalji. Wasn't there an article in the umpire last month? Uh, yes, there was. Uh, he sent it with his letter. It's, um, it's amongst those. Ah, yes, I remember. Extraordinary case. I'll have another look at it. As I read, the unmistakable accent of truth forced itself upon my attention, and I realized that I was in the presence of an appalling tragedy and that I was called upon to do what I could to set it right. I got other papers in the case, went up to Staffordshire, saw the family, and went over the scene of the crime. Between Ed Alge's house and the place where the final mutilation was committed lay the full breadth of the London and Northwestern Railway, an expanse of rails, wires, and other obstacles with hedges to be forced on either side, so that I, a strong and active man, in broad daylight, found it a hard matter to pass. Not until I had examined every fact thoroughly from every angle did I arrange to question Idalji. The meeting took place at my hotel. I had been delayed, and he was passing the time by reading the paper. I recognized my man by his dark face, so I stood and observed him. Mr. Adelgia, I presume. Oh, Mr. Ortu. Uh, do you suffer from astigmatic myopia? Uh, this is indeed an honor. Look, don't you wear glasses? Never have, Sir Arthur. They can't fit me glasses that are any use. I have been to two ophthalmic surgeons, and both... The idea of such a man scouring the fields at night and assaulting animals while avoiding the watchful police was ludicrous to anyone who can imagine what the world looks like to eyes with myopia of eight diopters. So bad was his defense in his trial that no mention, as far as I could ascertain, was ever made of the fact that the man was practically blind. Finally, Doyle wrote a series of articles in the Daily Telegraph. They provoked the public outcry, and Doyle was invited to a meeting with the Home Secretary. Not satisfied with simply clearing Idalji's name, Doyle now set out to discover the identity of the real slasher. Before long, he began receiving threatening letters with a seaport postmark, providing him with the clues he needed. Clearly, the letters were written by a disturbed, perhaps pathological man, who also despised foreigners. Doyle then traced Idalji's history from the time of the crimes backwards, all the way to Idalji's grammar school. Had there been a fellow student with a vicious nature, a hatred against foreigners, and a grudge against Idalji himself, 
and who subsequently went to sea, there had. Doyle discovered his present whereabouts and learned he had quit the sea at the time the slashings began. He had been trained in a slaughterhouse and he showed signs of periodic insanity. Doyle even got hold of a long horse lancet with which the slashings had undoubtedly been committed. The Law Society readmitted Idalji to the role of solicitors. Although the Home Office granted Idalji his pardon, they wouldn't agree to any compensation. However, the case in due course paved the way for establishing a court of criminal appeal. And this was only one of the good many real-life cases in which Doyle achieved success. Sherlock Holmes and his creator were inseparably linked. In his autobiography, Doyle admitted, A man cannot spin a character out of his own inner consciousness and make it really lifelike unless he has some of that character within him. The horse-drawn carriages of 1895 may have disappeared, but the living presence of Sherlock Holmes of Baker Street persists to this day. Nearly a hundred years after a study in Scarlet, letters still come in to that address at 221B Baker Street, now the offices of an insurance company who reply on Sherlock Holmes' behalf. And this one's from San Diego, California. Uh, it's addressed to Mr. Sherlock Holmes or Dr. John Watson, MD. For those who believe Sherlock Holmes was only a figment of a writer's imagination, in search of humbly submits its deduction that he did, in a very real way, exist. <laughs>